Apple wants its iPad lawsuit dismissed. Target might have to pay the banks for its data breach. And Microsoft takes on Google Voice Search in the Play Store. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 229 for Friday, December 5th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace recently launched the latest version of their platform, Squarespace 7, which has a completely redesigned interface, integrations with Getty Images and Google Apps, new templates, and an incredible feature called Cover Pages. Try the new Squarespace at squarespace.com and enter the offer code TECHNIGHT at checkout and you'll get 10% off. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Tech News Tonight. Let's get right into the tech feed of the day. All right, the 10-year-old class action suit against Apple for keeping customers from playing non-Apple purchased music on iPads, iPods rather, might be on shaky ground, turns out. Today, lawyers that are suing Apple in the case, which is about $350 million case, withdrew one of the named plaintiffs after they concluded that she didn't actually purchase an iPod between September 2006 and March 2009, which is the time period in question, the period where Apple is accused of preventing music from competing services from playing on its iPods. That leaves just one named plaintiff, which Apple said in a letter filed with the court on Wednesday, should be withdrawn as well, since the serial number of an iPod Touch bought by that plaintiff shows that it was purchased in July of 2009, which is after the period in question. Today, Apple filed a motion asking that the case be dismissed on the grounds that the iPods purchased by the two plaintiffs aren't actually relevant to the case. Now, Bonnie Sweeney, who is the plaintiff's lead attorney, told the federal judge overseeing the case that there was another iPod Touch that the plaintiff bought in 2008 and that she would respond to Apple's letter on Saturday. The judge has not yet ruled on Apple's motion. Well, it's kind of a legal, legal day here on TN2. There's more legal woes for Target, which experienced a huge data breach about a year ago. We talked about that at length in which over 40 million credit cards were compromised. Earlier this week, a federal judge rejected Target's bid to dismiss lawsuits by financial institutions that claim Target had played a key role in allowing its computer systems to be compromised. The ruling is one of the first court decisions to clear up some legal confusion that happens between retailers and banks when there are data breaches. The cost of replacing stolen cards from Target's breach alone is roughly $400 million, and the banks don't want to pay for what they claim is Target's security negligence. The judge ruled that changes that targets that charges rather that target ignored security software alerts and disabled some of its security features was at least enough for the banks to pursue that negligence claim. Five banks are pursuing class action status and seeking millions of dollars in damages from Target. A consumer-based class action suit is also separately being pursued. At the time of its breach last year, Target had installed a $1.6 million advanced breach detection technology from the company FireEye. But according to sources speaking with the New York Times, the technology gave warnings that Target ignored until hackers had already stolen a lot of data. Would you like to keep the legal thing going just for another couple of minutes? Okay, let's do it. Back in September, both Apple and Google announced that their newest phones would be encrypted by default, meaning that no one, not law enforcement, not even the companies themselves, could ever get that data off of the device. Now, on Thursday, Senator Ron Wyden, who's a Democrat in Oregon, introduced a bill that would make sure that the companies can continue to encrypt data this way, despite protests from the likes of the FBI. It's called the Secure Data Act, and it would prohibit government agencies from requiring any backdoors to be put in U.S. software or hardware. There's no current mandate that requires backdoors, but Wyden's bill would shut down law enforcement's efforts to get access. However, just last month, the Senate fell two votes short of moving forward with a bill that would have banned the massive phone database. So it's safe to say surveillance issues are still very much not cut and dry. Not yet anyway. You know what I'm thinking would be good on this rainy Friday? Some science. And here to help us with that is Sina Brewster, GigaOM Science in Tech reporter. Hey, Sina. Hi, Sarah. How are you? I'm doing well. Uh, so, all right. So I promised them science and, and we will indeed talk about science, but there's certainly some technology involved as well. You wrote a story uh, that Yale and a company called Organovo have teamed up 
to print 3D uh, human body organs for uh, transplants. So what's going on here? Because Organovo has been in the news quite a bit lately. Just last month, Organovo, Organovo was in the news for actually beginning to commercially sell 3D printed liver tissue. These aren't entire livers, but they are, you know, little bits of tissue that people can use for um, kind of different experiments. So not quite the transplant stage, but yes, Organovo is already 3D printing tissue. <laughs> So what, okay, so Yale, you know, and Organovo have teamed up. Obviously, Yale is, you know, there, there's, there's, there's research uh, that the, the university can get from this as well. There's money, uh, quite a bit of money being involved in the research. What, how far has Organovo gotten? I mean, you mentioned that they're selling 3D printed tissue, which, you know, a year ago, we would have all just absolutely shaken our heads at. How quickly is this technology advancing? Because as you mentioned in your article, Every day, we have an average of about 18 people who, who, who die while waiting for organ donation. There aren't enough organs to go around. It would seem that in this particular case of technology, even the U.S. government would want to push it through as quickly as possible. Yes, so it was only about a decade ago that a researcher patented the technology that Organovo is basing all this on, and that's really, it's a, it's a 3D printer. Um, and so now the government is very interested in it. Um, the National Institutes of Health are working with them on 3D printing eye tissue. Um, eye tissue, you know, you can study how disease progresses in an eye. You can develop um, new drugs that can help treat an eye disease. Um, yeah, it's progressing very fast. And this new partnership with Yale, the first thing they might be looking at is, okay, we're not quite ready to 3D print a functional organ that can work on its own, but maybe you print an organ and it helps out an ailing organ until someone can actually reach the front of that waiting list and get a transplant from another person. So it is coming very quickly. Um, just we're not quite printing entire organs yet. Well, and if I understand the technology correctly, 3D printed, printed organs that are based on the, the patient's actual, you know, date, cell data is, is a better bet than trying to get an organ from somebody who would be generous enough to donate one because then that might be rejected. Right. They can actually print these organs with the patient's own cells. And as you said, then it's much lower chance that the body will say, oh, this is something foreign and just totally reject the organ altogether. So it could be safer in the end. So I know that the technology, as you mentioned, is moving forward right along. You know, oftentimes here on TN2, we... We stay away from certain science stories that seem very cool, but kind of far off. If you had to, I don't know, you know, give some sort of a date range as to how something like this, how quickly something like this could be available to, to actual citizens, to regular people who have medical problems, what would you say? Oh man, that's a tough question <laughs> that I think even the people in the industry would have a tough time with. Um, you know, it's going to take quite a few years to develop this technology fully, it, you know, they need to figure out exactly how to print an organ. And then it needs to go through the full process of, you know, being okay for actual medical use. So I think, you know, this has to be at least a decade out, if not more. Ah, oh, decade out. I was hoping you'd say, oh, by 20, sometime in the late 2015, you know, we we're, we're all going to be printing ourselves better organs. I guess that's, <laughs> it doesn't work that way in science. Certainly not. Even if the 3D printers can do just about anything, organs are another, another story. Definitely. All right, Sina Brewster is the science and tech reporter over at GigOM. Thanks so much for joining us, Sina, and happy weekend to you. Oh, and before you go, remind folks where they can keep up with you online. Sure, I'm at gigaohm.com. Otherwise, I'm on Twitter at S-I-G-N-E-J-B. Excellent. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. All right, after the break, Sony Pictures employees are getting threatened by hackers, and AT&T is still throttling LTE Unlimited users. If you're one of those people, you should listen up. And of course, how Pokemon's doing in virtual reality. Got a little something for everybody. But first, let's thank Squarespace.com for sponsoring this episode of Tech News Tonight. It's the all-in-one platform. That's, you know, it's, it's, it's templates, it's hosting, it's, it's technical support behind the scenes. It's a truly all-in-one platform that makes it easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. Or, you know, any kind of website you want. They just look really good. I have been a faithful Squarespace user for years. I've, I've had a lot of fun getting to know the platform, but Squarespace 7 is the most recent form of Squarespace. 
and it just makes getting started easier than ever. You can live edit on one screen. That means you're not toggling between different views and preview modes and that sort of thing. You can preview designs in all sorts of device modes. So you can see how your site will look on different sized tablets and mobile devices. You now have instant access right from within Squarespace to Getty Images, that's professional stock photography. Some beautiful stuff for just $10 each. And Squarespace has also designed category specific templates that cater to different industries. You know, the food industry, or maybe you're a photographer, or, or you know, maybe you wanna sell, you know, some, I don't know, you knitted some teddy bears. I don't know, you've got options. The templates are lovely. And of course, e-commerce, if you're selling stuff, is available for all subscription plan levels. That's It's built into these templates. And you also have the ability to accept donations if that's more up your alley. Now, Squarespace plans start at just $8 per month. That's very reasonable because they also include a free domain name if you sign up for a year. And it's mobile ready. And as I mentioned, hosting is included. Squarespace takes care of all of the hosting so you don't have to. Squarespace has a few blogs too for iOS and Android that help you keep all your, your information, your comments, you want to make a little change on the go, all updated while you are mobile. All right, are you convinced? We would like you to start a free two-week trial. Just two weeks, you don't need to enter your credit card, it's completely free. Just start building your website and see which template you like best. When you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use the offer code TECHNIGHT. T-E-C-H-N-I-G-H-T is that offer code, and you'll get 10% off, and you can show your support for tech news tonight. To begin using Squarespace 7, even if you're already familiar with Squarespace, as an existing customer, you just go to the settings tab and activate all the new features. Thanks to Squarespace for their support of TN2, Squarespace, start here and go anywhere. All right, on to a few more stories that we're following today on Tech News Tonight. Microsoft has released an app for Android users called Torque, which lets, lets you shake your phone to perform a voice search, which is not unlike Google's own OK Google, right? Torque will provide a number of instant answers, including things like details on local flights or stock prices or sports scores, the weather, restaurants that are nearby, stuff like that. Torque itself has actually been supported on select Android smartphones since October, but the 2.0 release that's out today is on Google Play Store and includes information like those flight status reports and information on local events. These answers and other results are powered by Bing Search, obviously, and the app was developed by Microsoft Garage, which is a group that experiments with and releases cross-platform consumer apps. If you're an AT&T customer on an unlimited data plan, like I am on my iPad anyway, and you feel like maybe you're being throttled, well, you might be. The question of whether AT&T throttles its unlimited data, even in cases when the network isn't congested, depends on your plan. Ars Technica reports that AT&T did change its policy to stop the automatic throttling of many of its unlimited data plans, but its unlimited LTE data customers are indeed still being throttled. AT&T tells Ars that the policy will be changed for all customers sometime next year, but didn't give any specific dates. Until then, 4G LTE customers with unlimited plans aren't throttled until they reach five gigabytes of data, which, I mean, come on, guys. Five gigabytes does not take long at all, for me anyway. But then those customers are throttled for the remainder of the month at all times, all day and all night, even if the network isn't congested. Federal Communications Commission Chairman Tom Wheeler has pressured carriers not to throttle customers who pay for unlimited data unless there's a legitimate network need for it. Verizon doesn't currently throttle 4G users, although it does still throttle 3D ones in congested areas. It is still somewhat unclear who exactly was behind the massive hack against Sony Pictures last week, but the data intruders did get access to a lot of stuff and it was pretty bad. Numbers like movie budgets and employee salary information and social security numbers and healthcare files, unreleased films, just to name a few. It's bad. Variety is now reporting that Sony Pictures employees have received a mass threat from a source or sources claiming to be the same attackers that took down the company's systems last week. The attackers identify themselves as a global group focused on forcing Sony Pictures to change policies and say in the email that some employees have received that if they don't, quote, 
not only you, but your family will be in danger. Sony says that it has alerted law enforcement to the threat and sent a warning advising employees to turn off their mobile phones. I mean, you're going to see the email eventually, but okay. I would really like to end on a on something that makes me happy. Are you with me? Good. Okay. There's a new remake of Pokemon for the Oculus Rift that's floating around now. It's not the first one, actually, if you're, if you're following Oculus VR. But this one actually looks pretty darn cool. You pair the VR headset with a leap motion and voice attack, and then you can play the unofficial Pokemon Alpha prototype. Now, that's keyword unofficial there. It's just an unofficial demo that was made by a fan uh, named Tipitat, but it is available to download, at least for now. There are probably some legal issues here, so <laughs> hurry while you can. Not that I would ever condone illegal behavior. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight, this lovely Friday edition from rainy San Francisco. Thanks for joining us. Of course, you can subscribe to the show if you like it and you want it delivered into your hot little hands Monday through Friday. We are cool with that. Twit.tv slash TN2 is where you can get those subscription links. You can write us with feedback at TN2 at twit.tv. And you can watch live every day, every weekday anyway, at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. Next week starts Tech News Today and Tech News Tonight doing our morning evening coverage. Of course, Tech News Today starts at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. Hope you can join us for both. I'm Sarah Lane, and thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.